You guys know how much I hate a clickbait thumbnail. And here we are again, slaves to the algorithm. I don't even know how Ken and Barbie got dragged into this whole thing. Maybe it's the blonde hair. I don't, I don't know. But it's literally the main thing that people know about this case. It's like the Ken and Barbie killer. Here I am doing the same thing. Like I'm better than anybody. Stop. Listen, Barb, Kenny, if you're out there, you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm sorry. Hi guys. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn. I'm so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back to our True Crime Wine Wednesday. I missed you guys. Happy New Year. Most of you will be happy to know I did take the time to definitely enjoy a few days during this break that I took, but this case particular was one that's been so requested and it's definitely been one that I wanted to do for a while. I think primarily because I'm Canadian. So I feel like as like a true crime Canadian YouTuber, I should probably cover this case. My only reservation though is that it has been covered so many times that I wanted to make sure that I could gather as much content as I possibly could just to give you guys, you know, as much background information that I like to do and I know that you guys really appreciate too. So a lot of this break I took was researching this case and I had to take a lot of breaks throughout it for my mental health. <laughs> like this case, I'm not gonna go into extreme detail as to what happened to these victims, but it's really, really heavy. So I just want you guys to be aware of that prior to us starting. Before we get into it though, I did want to send out a huge shout out to my girl Gabby over at Gabulosis. She has been so amazing to me behind the scenes. When you do YouTube, you're really alone and there's no guideline for you to follow. Like everything is just kind of like, you're just kind of left to fend for yourself. So when you find somebody uh, who you can connect with and they're willing to genuinely help you and answer questions and just be straight up lovely. It's so nice. And I had a note on this case to give her a shout out and send her some love because I've been so thankful for her. And she ended up beating me to the punch and ended up doing it on one of her recent videos. And I've had so many lovely supporters of hers come by and pop by and say hello to me. And it just, it means so much to me if you are one of them who's done so and for Gabby herself. So thank you so much, girl. I just appreciate you all. I would love if my YouTube family did the same and went over to her channel and sent her some love. Her channel is so so well done, you guys. Um, she primarily covers, I think, not primarily, I think she only covers vintage cases. So there's nothing that's past 20 years or no. Everything on there is 20 years or older. So it really sets her apart. It makes her channel so unique and I know you guys will absolutely love it. I know you guys will get in a binging hole over there as well. So make sure you tell her I say hello and I am so appreciative of her. All right, so we're gonna get right into today's case. It is gonna be a long one. I was gonna do this in two parts, but I figured I'm just gonna kind of let it all go and see where we're at and then you guys can decide where you wanna pause if you need to take a break and then just resume on your own. I already have the case that I wanna cover next week in the works, so I didn't wanna kind of delay everything. And then this way, you know, it's just, it's already out there for you. Like I said though, I'm not going to go into graphic detail over what happened to the victims. I am going to touch on it. So if that's going to be a trigger for you, I just want to let you know there will be some reference to sexual assault and but if anybody is wanting to really grasp the severity and the horror of what happened, I would highly recommend reading the book that I read. It was called Deadly Innocence by Scott Burside and Alan Cairns, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. Again, forewarning, like I said, I had to take several breaks. It's not an easy one to get through. All right, let's get into it. Grab your snacks, grab your drinks. I should also say like start up your computer, get that mouse moving because most of you actually take me along to work with you, which is probably fitting for those of you who are drinking coffee right now because right now I'm on a decaf coffee kick and then I just put like a little bit of a French vanilla creamer in there. That's where we're at. I really miss wine if I haven't said it before. 
Okay, so if you're Canadian, you probably 100% know about this case and you know who Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka are. For me personally, this was the first case that I ever remember realizing that there were up people in the world and I was really young. I remember distinctly like the news having it all over the place, newspapers covering it every single day and it was the first time that my mom had ever sat me down and said do not ever approach a vehicle if they call you, don't ever go with somebody no matter if they look kind or not or say that they you know know your family like just just run if somebody tries to take you and I was like why are you telling me this like what the shit is going on right now and you know I was sheltered for the most part of not knowing the extent to what actually transpired but I knew like the name Paul Bernardo scared the shit out of me and up until that point I had never had fear or been aware of my surroundings when I was out from the house and I mean in those days you were out as soon as you woke up until the street lights came on and your parents were calling you for dinner. It was just such a different time and, and this was the first time that I was like, okay, let's be careful. So as I was reading this case, that like fear of his name, it just like came back. And now that I actually know what he did, it's just, it's as present as ever. I literally ordered mace off of Amazon for me and my family. <laughs> Whole other level this time, guys. So I'm gonna give you the same talk my mom gave to me, you know, if you see somebody, even if they look nice, approachable, don't do it. Someone needs directions, tell them to pull out their freaking iPhone. Everybody's got access to Google Map these days. Don't fall for it. And I just said Google Maps, Google, because this case goes to show you that you really cannot trust anybody, no matter if they look like the couple next door or not. Don't trust anybody. So Paul Bernardo, he was the youngest child born to Ken and Marilyn Bernardo. He was born on August 27th, 1964. And when I found that out, I was like personally offended that he is effing with our Virgo reputation. But actually my daughter told me that Virgos are like one of the like top zodiac signs for serial killers. Just a little fun fact. I'm good though. The Bernardos had already had a three year old son before Paul came along. They lived in a typical family community in Scarborough, Ontario. And Paul is described as looking like almost cherub-like. He looked very angelic, just like the perfect baby, almost like a, you know, Gerber baby. He had blonde, soft, curly locks, these big blue eyes. He had dimples and like everybody around the neighborhood when Marilyn would take him for walks were like, oh, can we see Paul? Like he's so freaking adorable. His mom, Marilyn, seems like quite an interesting woman. She was nice enough to people, but people who lived in their neighborhood said there was always something off about her. She was adopted as a child and raised in a really nice family. It was actually through her adopted parents that she met her husband because they were family friends with her husband's parents and they just felt like they, you know, kind of had the same interests and goals in life and they'd be a good fit. So they were almost like a, you know, like an arranged marriage throughout friends. And Ken and Marilyn, yeah, agreed that they've got the same views in life. So why not? It sounds like image was really important to them, mainly for Ken. It's like he wanted to have this image of like almost like a beaver cleaver family. He dressed, you know, to the nines all the time. They were the first family on the block to also get a pool, but they isolated themselves. So they never really bonded with neighbors or friends and like had people over to use that. It was just almost like he needed this, this show. That appearance didn't do too much for him personally though. Like it was almost like the spidey senses. Everybody throughout the neighborhood agreed that yeah, he looked really well presented himself outwardly, you know, like that he had it together, but there was always something about him that they just felt off about. And then Marilyn was described as being quite like disheveled, I guess. She'd always wear like moo-moos. She had gained a substantial amount of weight after marrying her husband you know, always had like wrinkled clothes and would wear like very like ratted and tatted t-shirts. So like together they didn't really like match. And then within the home, I guess she was always really on edge. She was quite a hypochondriac. So uh, one thing like people really remembered seeing like within their house was just like medicine cabinets full of, of medicine. 
So Paul was always out of the house, like any chance he could get. As soon as he woke up, he was out playing with his friends until he was called in for dinner. And neighbors remember Marilyn always calling the kids like just really loud and aggressively. And she'd be like, get in the fucking house or get in the god house like it was one or the other were her favorite call signals back calls if you will bernardo calls <laughs> that was stupid i'm never taking time off again it just it's like it gets worse the relationship between ken and marilyn also was quite odd um i've read conflicting reports on this some people think it's because they were in like an unhealthy abusive relationship but then others said they tolerated each other and they knew you know okay like for Marilyn Ken's a good catch because I kind of let myself go I'm a little frumpy and he provides well for me and then with Ken he was like had his things and she was always willing to stand by her man kind of thing um, so I, I didn't read too many like specifics on abuse, but they did sleep in separate bedrooms. Marilyn, I think was in the basement and Ken was the one upstairs. So there was never any love or affection. They just kind of existed together and they definitely weren't loving towards their children either. Like again, it was just like a, yeah, we're just kind of cohabitating together. Paul did really well in school. He was very athletic. He was part of the track team. I th believe he played hockey. He swam for his school team and he was also in Boy Scouts, although he was no Boy Scout. Segway. One example specifically was that he and his friends initially set out to do something nice for a charity and they did this like neighborhood drive to raise money for muscular dystrophy and they ended up raising like I think $30 or something like that and when it came time for his friend to collect the money, put it in an envelope and then take it to where they wanted to, Paul was like, you know what, actually, we're gonna keep this. You know, we worked hard for this. It's not even like that much money anyways for all of the time that we had to put into it. Um, we're just gonna keep it for ourselves. So they did. When he got to high school, again, he was really good in school. Like grades came easy to him. He was good looking. <laughs> I hate saying that he's like good looking, mostly because he's not my type. Like that just in general is not my type, like the pretty boy type. But then also when you just like, even if that was your type, like just barf Ugh. because of the person he is. Anyways, in school before anybody knew like what kind of guy this was, he was considered good looking. He was well known and popular and it was his siblings that were more outcast. People saw them as quite odd because they kept to themselves. His first girlfriend was very popular in school. She was like the school beauty. And she described Paul as very gentle and kind. He never pushed her to like do anything sexually that she wasn't comfortable doing. And at that age, like I think there's that pressure and Paul was always really patient, she said, and she appreciated that in him. She said she considered herself lucky that he was her first experience in love. Within a year of their relationship though, she did say that she saw a change in him. He became more controlling and if she went to go do things with other friends and he was invited, he'd get really upset. So the relationship didn't last long after she saw this shift in who she knew prior. After his brother graduated, he just hauled ass as soon as he possibly could and got out of the house. And Paul was a little resentful because he felt like he was kind of left behind to do all of like the things around the house. And so he fought quite a bit with his parents. And one day him and his mom are in a really, really heated argument and she just becomes unhinged and she calls him a bastard. And at first he's like, okay, like, cool good one. And then she keeps going and she's like, do you actually think that this is your father? And she shows a picture of his dad, like Ken, who he knows of his dad, like Ken Bernardo. And she's like, you look nothing like him. Do you want to know why? And then she goes to her bedroom and she pulls out a photo of this man who's a stranger. And she says, this is 
your real father. So what happened was Marilyn had had an affair while she was at home visiting her family, which she did often. Ken would stay back home and he would work and then Marilyn would travel and go and visit her family. And during one of these trips, she ended up rekindling, you know, a brief little fling with an ex-boyfriend of hers and she got pregnant with Paul at the time. She did confessed to her husband what had happened and Ken agreed to raise Paul as his own but things started to click to Paul because he felt like there had always been this like resentment from his father towards him and he didn't know why and so now he's like perfect you know like I've lived my whole life trying to impress this man and figure out you know why I didn't have this like connection with him and it's because you're a like he hated his mother from this point on and he would often call her a whore or a slut just really express to friends like how much this lie and this affair affected him and then things got a worse for Paul as far as like his father too um within the neighborhood there was reports of somebody like a peeping Tom that was looking through young girls windows and they wouldn't they couldn't catch him but they could see like somebody had been there like through footprints and stuff and eventually the guy's caught and it turns out to be Ken Bernardo so Paul's like what the hell is going on with this family this guy he and his sister they decide to get out of the house to pay his bills at this time he started working for a company called Amway Amway is it's like one of the oldest MLMs that I can remember like hearing about next to like Mary Kay or Avon. And he wasn't successful in it. Side note, if um, you're ever into like MLM videos, I have also, I'm, I'm done. I binged all Kiki Chanel's channel and she does like anti MLM videos. And I'm going to say like, first of all, I'm not like anti MLM. I know a lot of people like within my life that have done MLM businesses, but I do believe that there's a certain way to do it and like just don't like cross that moral boundary. So when I was reading about this and like the tactics that he learned from this Amway, it totally reminded me of Kiki Chanel's channel. So check it out. So yeah, he wasn't successful in it, but within these MLM businesses, usually you do like a lot of, I guess it's almost like self-help reading and like self-development courses and stuff, but even those things themselves can be a little bit scammy. You know, like following certain business models of just like having just like no regard for people in general and all you're looking at is just like a paycheck. And it teaches you how to connect with people but it's very false and it's j disingenuine. It's almost like it teaches you how to like, just like be a narcissist, like mold into something that you're not. And that's what he did. I mean, there are people who can do it properly, but he definitely took like that negative side to it and was like, huh, like I'm learning how to talk to absolutely anybody, pretend that I'm engaging in this conversation and I can relate to things that I don't give an in shit about. And he used it to like prey on people mostly women. So when he realizes he's not going to make it in the Amway world, he decides to register for college and he's accepted into the University of Toronto to become an accountant. His childhood friends, they say they noticed quite a shift in him around this time. Um, he thought that he was better than anybody if he was in like the higher paying courses than they were. And he just had started walking around with like this God complex. And that started to like spill into... I guess you could call it like this fantasy life of his. Like he literally thought that if he worked hard enough and he was successful enough, he could have this like farm of women who actually, let's rephrase that, not women, like virginal girls, like young teens who were at his disposal on this farm and would do and say whatever he pleased. And he would literally talk about this to friends. Like he would say that shit out loud and admit that to people. And they were like, oh, okay, didn't really know how to take it. They're like, yeah, like that would ever happen. So they just kind of brushed it aside. Like 
almost like an ego thing. They also started seeing a violent side to him that he had never showed before. One night he and a girlfriend had gotten into an argument while they were at a friend's house because prior to arriving at the house, her and her friends had stopped at a bar to have some drink with some of their friends. And she like forgot to tell him that she was making this stop before going to see him. So he absolutely lost it. He started beating her up and wouldn't stop until his friends actually physically had to remove him from her. A few hours later, he like composes himself and convinces her, you know, like that he just completely lost it. This was just a one-time thing. He didn't know what happened. And, you know, he's this smooth talker in his mind. So she believes him for a little bit and she decides to stay with him. Ultimately, he really didn't need to put this poor girl through anything else because he wasn't even faithful to her. He had like a whole like Rolodex full of girls that were willing to follow along with everything, knowing they were like secrets in his life and definitely okay with him mistreating them. Like just, it's sad. But it worked because often he would look for younger girls who just didn't know their worth yet. He would even hang out with guys that were younger than him so he could lie and say that he was younger and then people would believe it easier because he was hanging out with that crowd and get his claws like further into that like younger group. He was a con in everything he did. An image was always really important to him like his father. He followed the whole like fake it till you make it thing and told that to friends too, you know, which is another like MLM tactic is that like you pretend that you've got this like really successful life and this is you know if you join my team this is what's gonna happen and you can have all these things and really behind the scenes like it, they're not living that life so that's definitely something that he applied he got an internship at a really well-known accounting firm while he was still in school and people said like he would walk around like in these like really really like expensive suits he looked like he was like the top dog in this whole firm and really he was like just an intern but that was like the persona that he was giving off by all accounts like he was good at his job and people did see him as a top prospect after he graduated but he didn't make a lot of money at this time the way he made money was like he, when he was younger he would just get involved in scams and like get rich quick schemes anything he could find to steal and sell like he was game. So one night while he's on the prowl with some friends to like con the next lady or person to buy something, who knows? He's out on the town with his friends. They decide to go to one of their favorite pizza places. And as they're going up, there's like, you know, you can see the window of people who are sitting inside and he notices two girls sitting there. And one is this beautiful blonde who caught his eye. So he like zeroes in before he's even in the shop. That blonde turned out to be Carla Mocha. Right about now, this is where I'd probably grab the bottle of wine and drink it. So if you want to do that for me, go for it. Carla was born on May 4th, 1970. She was born to Carl and Dorothy Homoka. Her father had immigrated to Canada from Czech Republic. He was a very successful salesman and he provided very well for his family, which also included two other daughters. There was Lori, who was two years younger than Carla, and then Tammy, who was the baby, who was five years younger. And Carla's friends describe her as very rebellious. She was the first friend they had ever seen when they went to their house that was like aggressive to their parents and would like swear at them and storm off and slam their door. Like she just had this angsty side to her. And they didn't always really get it because I guess on the outside, their family seemed, you know, very giving. They loved their girls. And it was the place that all of their, like her friends wanted to be. If they had the choice to have like Carla over at their house or go to her house, they'd always go to her house. Her parents were easy going. They had a pool out there. So they didn't really understand like where the aggression came from. She went to a very sophisticated school, but she danced to the beat of her own drum. She was not into the preppy scene at all. You know, like back in this day, it was like, you know, like those big sweaters and like the jeans and the 
preppy muted colors but she was like no I'm not I'm not following along with this she always had like really like funky vibrant hair colors experimented a lot with clothes that like weren't popular at all so her, her she herself was not popular but didn't care at all she had her group she didn't want any part of you know conforming and she was like the leader of her own Carla club her career goals at this time were to either be a police officer or a veterinarian I guess she cared enough about preserving life so much that even an insect was like precious to her I read this story where she was in I believe biology class where they were going to dissect earthworms and she just like kicked up this big stink about it she was like there's no point in cutting this earthworm open and looking inside when it's right here in the textbook we know exactly what we're going to see why are we doing this and she was rallying the class and saying you know you shouldn't think that this is okay and participate in this either. So because of this passion, her first job was naturally at a pet store. And it was actually because of this job that she met Paul. She and a girlfriend who also worked with her at the pet store were invited to go to a convention with her manager in Toronto. So on October 17th, 1987, her and her friend, they decide to leave the hotel to go and grab a bite to eat. And that's when they found this pizza place. It was called the Pizza Stop. And this is where Paul and his friend walked in. I guess they made eye contact as soon as they walked in and the guys walked over to the girls and asked if they could join them at the booth and have their pizza. And they like giggly, like so excitedly agreed. So Paul takes a seat next to Carla and he finds out that she's from St. Catharines and that she's only gonna be there for the weekend because she's there for this like convention. So after they are done eating, the girls want to still hang out with these guys. So they invite them back to the hotel room. And I guess Carla and Paul get busy right there in the room while their friends are there that first night. From that point forward, they were pretty much an item. Paul was 23 at the time and Carla was 17. And she actually had a long distance relationship going with somebody that she had gone to school with, but he moved to the States. So she broke it off with him and then she told her friends, you know, like don't ever speak about him again. Paul doesn't like the thought of like me ever having been in a relationship prior to him. So after she ended it with him, like no one ever spoke of him again. Carla would tell them that Paul wanted to live under this like guise that there had never been anybody before her. Definitely tying back into this whole like virginal farm fantasy that he would talk to his friends about. In their relationship, he courted her quite traditionally. You know, he'd buy her expensive bouquets of flowers. He'd take her to really fancy dinners. He would also drive from Scarborough to St. Catharines on a Friday and a Saturday. Like he would drive and visit her and then drive back home. And then the next day he would drive back out again so that he could see her for both days of the weekend and so that he could like respect her parents and not ask them if he could spend the night even to her parents like he he really presented himself like as a super respectable young guy for their daughter despite the age gap I guess she was absolutely lovesick. Her friend said she would like sign her name, Carla Bernardo, in absolutely every piece of paper, notebook, mirror, anything she could get her hands on and managed to find a way to bring him up in every single conversation she had with them. And they also noticed that she started to slowly alter her appearance to kind of fit the preppy tone that he had. It didn't happen overnight and like it was something she kind of denied when they'd be like, oh, like that piece of clothing looks a little preppy. She'd be like, oh yeah, you know, like Paul bought it for me, but she'd mix and match it with like something grungy and funky that like suited her. And then eventually like all of that just got phased out. For him, he was smitten too for I think whatever capacity he could be, but he still had girlfriends on the side while he was home in Scarborough. But he told his friends that he wanted to make an effort to, you know, like, commit to her like she's my girl I might like go out with this girl for a little bit but I think long term I'd probably commit to her and that was mainly because of her age and the fact that he knew that whatever he said went you know he could call the shots and she was very impressionable and she just like 
saw stars whenever she looked at him, so he knew that she'd be like a ride or die. He built a decent relationship with the Homokas as well. It didn't take long for them to be like, you know what, listen, you don't have to keep doing these trips back and forth, you can just stay here. And they saw him as like a nice mature match for Carla and also somebody that could help look out for their other two daughters. He paid particular attention to Carla's younger sister, Tammy. He would make comments to his friends, you know, that she would be a really good catch to pursue. He'd make comments about her body and a lot of focus on the fact that somebody landed her, they'd be so lucky because she's a virgin. She was untouched and she was beautiful. And so he really had this like obsession with that with her. And it's just completely inappropriate. Fuck twisted she's a kid he would try to downplay it as like oh it's just like me being an older brother being protective looking out for her type thing and for Tammy I think that that's what she felt too she was very comfortable around Paul she would sit on his lap and like watch a movie cuddle up with him and Carla and I think she just like felt safe around him when she was 14 she started dating this boy that she liked and she talked to Paul about it and I guess she said everything was going really well but she was was starting to feel like it was getting at that point where I think he was expecting more and she wasn't really sure if she was ready and he fucking loses it he's like absolutely not like you do not do that whatsoever like who is this guy where does he live and he talks to his friends about it like obsessively he's like we need to go to this kid's house we need to find out where he lives we need to beat the shit at him and scare him to like never even think about touching Tammy like he did not want anybody to touch her and for like the Homoko family they kind of saw this like protectiveness as you know very endearing and and they were like oh you what you know what a great guy like he's just he just he really cares like they're they're in great hands with him so he really built this trust like within that whole family and even kind of had like a little bit of control he became like buddy buddies with um Carl Homoka they would drink beers I guess Carla's dad was known to enjoy you know having several beverages an evening and that actually was like the only time that Carla would talk about having problems in her family was like she'd be like oh my dad's drinking again like what a jerk because I guess not every time he drank he was the nicest but Paul and him they always got along well Paul even adopted the same nickname for Carla that Carl would call Dorothy which was usually bitch or you old bitch Paul would call Carla that like in front of her family and like no one batted an eye it was just like what you called her their friends who would see this said that Carla didn't even care if he was asking her to get a drink she would just like get it and they never wanted to show any like cracks so I think that was part of it too they always wanted to have this impression that they had this ideal perfect relationship something to look up to so it was almost like oh like it's a joke like we're so in love he even buys her this like promise ring that's like really like the size of an engagement ring while she's still in high school that she's like showing off it's just like everything is this image of an absolutely perfect relationship their plans after Carla's graduation was for them to just you know get married and have babies Carla didn't even go to school because Paul was like you know there's there's not really going to be a point because we're going to get married and we're going to have kids pretty soon so like paying the money to go through school when you're going to stay home at the, with the kids it just it doesn't make sense so she didn't and he was really banking on this like accounting career of his except for when it came time to do the exam he was more busy with like hosting and entertaining his friends all the time and like showing off this lifestyle that didn't exist that he actually failed the exams because he didn't even study but he doesn't want to tell anybody that he's failed these so all of a sudden it was like excuses that started coming up he'd be like oh yeah I left Price Waterhouse because I realized you know they're just like gonna scam me I do way better if I was like freelancing on my own another time he said they screwed him over but wouldn't go into specifics 
And then he used another excuse that he had dated a girl within the company and she turned out to be like really crazy and stalkery and it was causing problems. So he decided to leave the company. So he's still forging forward on this like perfect life. He proposes to Carla after graduation at a Christmas festival in Niagara Falls, which didn't really mean much. He was still like sleeping around behind her back and seeing other girls. He was living off unemployment, but he was like whining and dining these girls and giving the impression that he was still in this accounting life. I think he actually said that he had graduated and was like a full blown accountant at this point, which wasn't true. He actually ended up filing for bankruptcy in 1990 because he owed like $25,000 on his credit cards. So once he couldn't use his credit cards anymore or like get more, Carla started taking them out in her name so they could you know, upkeep this illusion of like a really successful life together. And one of the purchases on this credit card is a camcorder. Paul becomes obsessed with taping absolutely every moment of his life, his friends, Carla and her families, anything he can record. So on the 23rd of December, 1990, he's at the Homoka's house and they're doing like a Christmas night dinner celebration together. The video is pretty much of Carla and him just going around to the family members. It's really annoying where they're like pretending they're from Wayne's world, constantly going like extreme close up, you know what I mean? Like completely ruined in Wayne's world. So in this video, you see Carla's younger sister, Tammy, and she's visibly drunk. She had been indulging in like the Christmas beverages with her family all day. Paul and Carla and the Mochas say that that evening, Paul and Carla went downstairs to join her father and they were watching a show. And at some point, like everybody within the family had like come down and joined them. And halfway through, it, as it was getting later, um, Carla's parents and her sister Lori decide they're gonna go to bed and leave Paul and Carla to watch over Tammy and they're like you know make sure she doesn't drink anymore like she's had enough for the night. Next thing that happens is around 1 a.m. and the Homokas wake up to a chaos in their house. There's ambulance and first responders everywhere. And they go down into Carla's room and they're trying to resuscitate Tammy. Paul and Carla said that all three of them had been watching TV and they had dozed off and then woken to sounds of like gurgling and Tammy struggling to breathe. So they figured it was from mixing drinks all night and having too many of them. So they said they took her off of the couch and tried to like position her so she could vomit and breathe, but they couldn't get her to wake up. So as paramedics are working on her, they notice that there's like this obvious distinct red mark on her face and she's taken away immediately by ambulance to go to the hospital with her parents. So a detective stays behind to ask Carla and Paul what happened. And Paul interrupts and he's like, you know, like no drugs were involved. So the detective's like, okay, makes note, not to say that no drugs are involved, but just to be like, why would you offer that information, Paul? And as they're chatting, the phone rings and the detective takes the call and it's another one of the officers that went with the family to the hospital and he calls to say that Tammy didn't make it. So he tells Carla, Paul and Lori, and I guess Lori absolutely loses it. She runs upstairs crying and the detective follows her to make sure that she's okay. And when he comes back down, he finds just Paul and he's like in hysterics and he goes around looking and he sees that Carla is in the laundry room and she's washing a comforter. That so he's like, I need everything to like stay as it is. We still need to like check out this area and like take any evidence. So he like stops the machine and she's like, oh, like, sorry. So he goes back and re-questions them and they're like, yeah, as soon as they heard her struggling to breathe, they moved her from the couch and then they say that it wasn't bright enough in that little rec room. So Carla's bedroom was right next to that space. So they dragged her over there where there was like more light and that's when they started performing CPR on her, but they both realized they were doing it wrong. So that's when they called 911 and called for help. So the detective asks about these marks that were on her face and Paul, he doesn't really have an explanation, but he's like, oh, you know, I think when we were dragging her from one room to Carla's, um, she got like rug burn on her face. So the detective's like, so you like, flipped her off and then dragged her by her face. 
I read that Paul actually didn't even like reply yes or no. So the detective just again like jots this down as questionable. So when it came to Tammy's funeral, I guess everybody in the family was just appropriately upset and mourning and crying. And Paul was like over the top devastated like sobbing blubbering disaster family and friends say that he was just like standing over her casket the whole entire time and he would just like stare at her and as friends would come up he would just make comments like like wasn't she so beautiful look how beautiful she is and he would like stroke her hair at one point he even takes off this ring that he had worn like for so long in his life takes it off and he puts it on her ring finger. So people who were there, they're just like, something's not right. Like why, why is he this hysterical? And then eventually it was just kind of explained away that he probably felt responsible because he was the one who was there, who couldn't revive her, who had been drinking with her that night. So it was, you know, noted that it was bizarre, but there was an explanation for it. And when the autopsy came back, there wasn't anything that was overly suspicious. Um, it was just concluded that she had accidentally died from consuming too much alcohol and choking on her vomit. Um, the only thing that they didn't have like a clear explanation for was this mark on her face, but they thought they had enough evidence, you know, compiled to say that it wasn't foul play and that it could have either been a drag mark from the carpet or possibly acid from the vomit that she was already trying to get off and like was just sitting in. So they rule her death accidental. After she dies though, Carla's family who was once like very close to him, they started getting like turned off of the whole situation. Not because they felt like he was responsible for anything, but because he was just like over the top. Like this was their daughter, their family, and he seemed to be like really mopey and just over the top, constantly talking about it. And it just like seemed in inappropriate for them. And they were like, we, we just can't deal with this anymore. So Carla tells Paul about it and he's offended and pissed off that like her family doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. So they both decide that they're going to leave the Homoka house and move in together. So they move into a pretty nice house at 57 Bayview Drive and everyone's wondering like how they can afford this because Paul hasn't worked for the past two years. But they didn't know that Paul is Paul and he's always got like some sort of scam going on. So behind the scenes he and his best friend from like childhood had this whole like cigarette booze smuggling thing going on. They would travel to the States, they grab a bunch of cartons of cigarettes and alcohol for a lot cheaper than in Canada and then they'd bring it up and they'd sell it here. So remember, even throughout this time, everything that's happened to Tammy, Paul and Carla are engaged and they are deciding that they still want to forge through with this wedding. So on one of these trips that him and his friend are taking, they decide to go do this like impromptu bachelor party in Florida. And they meet these two girls there and they end up like kind of almost be like double dating for an entire weekend. And on one of the nights they go to this bar and the girl that Paul was with was like really cute, dressed like, you know, very clubby and feeling herself. And this guy like walks by and he makes a comment at her, kind of like a cat call. And instead of her being like, you know, like I'm with somebody, cause like she just met him like 24 hours earlier, why would she? She kind of gives like a hey pose as he walks by. And I guess Paul loses it. He's like, if you're gonna be with me, like you're gonna respect me. If you wanna be with him, go and be with him. And she's like, dude, like we literally just met. What do you mean? Like he just walked by and it completely threw her off, but almost like instantly he just breaks down and starts crying and she's like, what the hell's going on? So he says like, sorry, he didn't know what took over him, but something had like triggered him and he just started to remember about his little sister that had just died named Tammy. So she kind of forgets about this outburst and starts consoling him. Cause she's like, okay, well yeah, like clearly, you know, people mourn in different ways and this is a decent excuse, I guess, like tries to make him feel better. So they spend the rest of the weekend together and then when it's done, her and her friend are like, oh, we'll never see these guys again. It was just like this weekend thing. But Paul and his friend, they arranged to meet up with them again the following weekend. And then this girl sees more red flags, one of them being that he was extremely aggressive, like intimately with her. 
And also his best friend kept like slipping up and referring to someone named Carla when he was talking to Paul. And so she's like, hey, like, who's this Carla girl? And he's like, oh, that's um, my sister who died. It's her good friend. Just weird. When he gets home, I guess he doesn't even try to hide this fling he shows Carla like footage of the weekend with his friends and these girls and them at the club like dancing and kissing and hooking up in the hotel and Carla's just like okay cool his friend said he was like nervously sitting there and Carla just looked at its stone face and was like thank you for showing it to me and reading about them as a couple it seemed like they were the couple that everybody wanted to hang out with they were like the ones who like hosted everything and people wanted to be around them they did a lot of double dating and had like other couple friends that came over and they'd cook dinner for them but over time people started to feel uneasy around them they felt like it was awkward that Paul would hit on other girls in front of Carla specifically even one time when she was upstairs sleeping and he had brought girls back to the house he like hooked up with one of them in the bathroom while she was home and they were like we don't want to be a part of this it's uncomfortable and he was like Carla Carla doesn't care so it just like wasn't really something they wanted to be a part of though and then not only that when it came to like his relationship and like matters that happen like privately they're like okay that's you know their own business if she doesn't mind you know who are we to judge but then they started seeing messed up shit go on one night when Paul cut off the head of his pet lizard because it bit him in front of his friends like literally took it out of its they're not cages what are they called aquariums yes takes this poor thing out and like brings it to the kitchen and people are like oh my god like what are you gonna do and chops like several times to make sure that it actually like goes through and not only that but he takes it a step further and tells his friends you know that like lizard and like reptiles are a delicacy in China he lights up the barbecue and he gets Carla to like skin it because she knows how to like dissect things and I don't really know why from like a veterinarian but anyways apparently she was like knowledgeable in this so like skins this lizard to prepare for barbecuing and he barbecues the thing and eats it with his friends so yeah several people pulled back and they would say the main reason why was because if they made a comment trying to defend Carla if they didn't like the way that Paul was treating her she would get really defensive and being like I don't need you to stick up for me I love him so much like there's nothing wrong mind your business and that's what creates a lot of controversy in this case because she didn't seem to be phased or affected by anything that Paul did and didn't care enough so to actually go through with marrying him and on June 29th 1991 They do get married. The wedding sounds like an absolute clusterfuck. There was like 150 guests and many of them made comments about the grooms looking completely disheveled like they had just parted the entire night and looks like they slept in their suits because they were all like crinkly and they had actually like no one had gone to bed including Paul who actually had brought girls home where Carla and her bridesmaids were the night before the wedding to stay up all night and party with. So they arrived late to the wedding. They made the other wedding party that was going to get married after them late and they're just like waiting in the parking lot for their turn. I guess his mom was like an absolute disaster too. She was in this like wrinkly frumpy little something and she was talking really loudly and chewing her gum really loudly throughout the entire ceremony. When it was over, Paul and Carla, they leave in like this horse drawn carriage And I guess the horses had like pooped everywhere, but nobody did anything about it. They just like left it for the church to clean up after. And they're just like cheersing each other in their little horse carriage, like their dollar store version of Diana and Charles. And they just clunk away. And then at the dinner, his mom ends up making this big scene in front of everybody because she sees that Paul had chosen to serve pheasant for dinner and she was like I don't eat birds you did this to spite me and just loses it. So after that they go on this two-week honeymoon to Hawaii and when they get back from their honeymoon it's Carla's parents who pick them up from the airport and she's like while you guys were gone they discovered the body of that missing girl. Paul and Carla are like what missing girl? 
and she's like Leslie Mahaffey. Leslie Mahaffey was born to Dan and Debbie Mahaffey on June 5th, 1976. She was their miracle baby, they said. Debbie, years prior, had beat ovarian cancer, but part of the treatment was like really aggressive drug that her doctors told her would completely eliminate the chance of her ever having children. So when they had Leslie, they were absolutely over the moon because they thought this is just was never going to be an opportunity that they had. And then not only that, but seven years after she was born, they also had a little boy. They grew up in a town called Burlington and they seemed like an ideal family, you know, like the mom, dad, one girl, one boy, and Leslie and her brother were very, very close. Their parents had successful careers. Her dad was an oceanographer, which would be such a cool job, but I'm terrified of the ocean. Anyways, he was an oceanographer and her mom was a school teacher. Leslie was described as a very bright and pleasant child. And as um, she grew up, she wasn't rebellious, but she was just more headstrong and like stuck in her ways. She knew what she wanted, where she wanted to go. She was a free spirit and she didn't want to be tied down. And she got along well with her parents, but because of that like personality, she didn't want like to follow curfew or have like these like really strict set of rules. So she did start to rebel. This rebellious streak led her to not always make the best decisions. She got caught shoplifting when she was like 15 years old and she had run away from home. She kind of made running away from home a little bit of a pattern, but her family said that no matter what, like even if they were arguing and she wanted, you know, she was like not coming back to the house and she was gonna break curfew and grounding or whatever, she did always call to check in to be like, I'm okay. So her parents just took it as this, just this phase that she was going through of like, you know, like a troubled teen and just, this is a phase, she's gonna get out of it. So on the day of June 14th, 1991, Leslie attends a wake for a good friend of hers who was killed in a car accident with some other friends from their high school. And she told her mom she was going to be home for her 11 p.m. curfew. That night, it sounds like after the wake, the kids went to like an outdoor hangout, probably like the, a bonfire type style. And she looks down and she realizes that she's late. She's missed her curfew. So instead of like rushing home, she's like, oh, like I'm already late now. Like, so at this point, it doesn't matter if I'm five minutes late or from five hours late. So she decides that she's gonna hang out with her friends even longer. So her good friend says that around 1.50 a.m. he walks her home. I guess she tried the back door of the house and it was locked. And then she tried like the windows and they were all closed and locked. She went to the front of the house the door was locked as well. And she's like, oh my God, like my parents, they're playing me. Like they just want me to ring the doorbell. So I wake them up. They can see what time I got home and I'm gonna get in shit. So she decides to walk to a payphone to call her best friend and see if she could stay the night there. And her best friend's like, I don't wanna like wake my mom up and get involved. I actually read that like that, her best friend and her mom had already kind of got a talking to by Leslie's mom because they had gotten out of her out of a bind before. And she was like, you know, like don't help her out. She needs to learn, like, like don't get involved and give her a, a place to like run away to. So she was like, after that, like I'm, I'm not waking up my mom at two o'clock in the morning to see if you can come over. So they talk for like 30 minutes and her friend's like, you know what, just like, just go home. It's not gonna be that bad. Like it's nothing you haven't dealt with before. So she gets off the phone and she says it's around like 2.30 and that Leslie said, okay, like I'm going in, I'm gonna go ring the bell. In the morning when her mom wakes up though, Leslie's not home and she doesn't think too much of it. She thinks that she probably just ended up staying at a friend's house that night because they were all hanging out sad about the friend that had just passed away. And she also knew that morning, the actual funeral for that friend was going to take place. So she figured as soon as that was done, she was gonna come home. And when she finds out that Leslie didn't go to the funeral, she knew something was up and she called the police immediately and they put out like a bolo to look for her. But unfortunately, since she had already been reported like a runaway before and this was something she did, they didn't like jump on the opportunity to get out and actively look for her. And so Leslie's family and friends were left to kind of do that on their own. So on June 29th, 1991, which was Carla and Paul Bernardo's wedding, there is a father and son that are out fishing and they're just about to like take off in the boat and they see this 
like concrete off to the side in the water and he grabs the paddle and he just kind of like taps it and he thinks he sees something in there but he's like I think my mind's playing tricks on me like I feel like it looks like a human but I don't want it to be a human like is it a mannequin we all know after the Black Dahlia case like it is never a mannequin never so as he's like passing uh, another couple that are out on the water he's like I don't know if this is just me if it's something you might want to look into over there like I saw some concrete and like it looks like somebody was in there if you guys want to check it out be like a second opinion so they're curious and they go over and they confirm that yes there is definitely a body in this concrete so they call the police and when the police get there they find like several pieces of concrete and leslie had been the only girl who had recently been reported missing but investigators had gone back a few times because the person they found their hair didn't seem to match leslie and also their eye color didn't match i believe leslie had blue eyes and this person appeared to have brown eyes so they end up requesting dental records from her dentist and on july 10th they finally come back and they confirm that this person was leslie mahaffey and the reason for the discoloration in her eyes was because there was lime that was mixed in with the concrete and like caused the pigment to change. I was really disappointed reading people's reactions to finding Leslie. A lot of it was like, well, you know, like this is what happens when you don't listen to your parents. This is what happens when you run away. Like, what did you expect? And it's like, she was 15 years old. Regardless of the circumstances, nobody deserves to be found in the condition that she was or to be judged to be in that position. And nowadays we see even like so much more of the just unsolicited opinions on social media. And I'll just never understand what makes a person literally like write something out to ruin someone's day and like share just a shitty ass opinion. Anyways, go spread some love. Unfortunately, after Leslie was found, everything went cold pretty fast. There was no leads that they had to follow. Everything was really washed away by not only the concrete, but being found in the water. So it remained unsolved. And then less than a year after she was found, on April 16th, 1992, another girl goes missing. And her name is Kristen French. Kristen was born on May 10th to Doug and Donna French. Doug was married uh, prior to meeting Donna and he had four grown children. And then when he met Donna, they married and then they had two of their own. They had a son and Kristen. And I guess Kristen was described as a daddy's girl. She was like the youngest girl and really close to him. And she was also close to his other kids. Like she had like her older siblings and everyone seemed to get along really well. In fact, they, they sounded like picture perfect. Doug and Donna raised the kids in the same house their whole entire life, even as they became more successful in their careers and could like upgrade their living situation. They couldn't bring themselves to do it because they said like every corner that they looked at in the house just had like one memory after the other. So they just like stayed in that house. For some reason, it reminded me of like Father of the Bride. You know, like they were just picturesque. I guess Kristen was the poster child for exactly what you would want in a daughter. She was very well loved in school, not only by the students, but by the teachers. She was very intelligent. She was kind to everybody. She was very athletic. And she was also on the honor roll to top it off. Her teammates said she was also the one who like got everybody going and not in like a really aggressive like we've got a win way but like super excited to be a part of the team and get everybody to like unleash their full potential. Um, even one girl said that she cared like so much about everybody being successful and not just always about winning but like knowing your worth that while she was in a skating competition, I think it was like speed skating maybe, Anyway, she saw one of her teammates who was lagging. I don't know if she fell or something had happened, but she was like in the running to like win this thing. And she goes back and like encourages her friend to like get up and finish with her. Just obviously an all around like sweetheart. So on the day that Kristen went missing, everybody in school was really excited because it was gonna be a four day weekend uh, because it was Easter. Kristen specifically was really excited. This was gonna be a special one because her boyfriend, he was gonna come and celebrate Easter with her family. 
And this was like, you know, typical young love. She was head over heels in love with him. She wore a ring that had his initial on it. She wore a necklace from him. He would wake up super early before school started so that he could go and watch like her sports practices and be there. And they just, they just sounded really, really cute. So she leaves school and she walks home and this day is, it's pretty crummy outside. It's really rainy and like mucky out, but she only had like a, a mile to go to get home. So several students say they did see Kristen walking that day and she was just like her typical like smiley self like couldn't be bothered that it was pouring rain just like going on with her day At around this time that she's walking home there's a woman who notices a young girl who's in the parking lot of a church that's nearby and it looks like she's like struggling at the side of a car door and she says like she couldn't get a good look at what was going on but it almost looked like somebody was kind of having like a tiff with maybe their significant other so she didn't think too much of it or like want to get involved but like made note and then carried on because she was going to pick up her child from school so Kristen's dad actually gets home early that day he's arrives around like three and he's expecting to kind of like meet her at the door and when he gets there she's not there so he doesn't think too much of it like right away, but she is not the type of girl who will go from school to like a friend's house and not tell her parents. So he knows that she's gonna be coming home like within any minute. And as time goes on and she's not coming, he starts to panic. So he calls her mom at work and he's like, you know, Kristen's not home yet. And she's trying to reassure him, you know, like I'm sure there's a really good reason. Maybe this was like the one time it slipped her mind to call us and she's at someone's house, possibly could have just been staying after school to help a teacher out. Like we don't know yet. But when she gets home around like 4.50 and Kristen's still not home, she freaks out. So she calls the principal of the school and she's like, you know, did, is Kristen there? Did she stay behind to do anything? And the principal says, no, she left like with all the other students and panic sets in. So they call the police to report her missing. Around the time that this missing persons call was placed, there is a woman who works at the church who notices that there's a single shoe in the parking lot. And initially she wasn't gonna do anything with it, but she decided to um, put it like on the ledge of like the sign that was there. So anybody who was missing it could like easily see it if they were driving by. And by this time, Kristen's friends had gotten news that she was missing. And so a lot of them were out looking for her. And one of her girlfriends was driving with her mom and she notices the shoe and she's like, oh my God, like that's Kristen's shoe. So she grabs it and it just so happens that there were police that were canvassing the area and they were a couple doors down. So they go over and they're like, this shoe belongs to Kristen. So when they take it back to Doug and Donna, they're, they confirm that it's hers and they know specifically because there was like a certain arch support in it for Kristen's foot. So they go back to the church parking lot and then they also find like a lock of her hair, what they believe is her hair. So they're like pretty confident now, obviously that she's not like this runaway and that she was abducted in broad daylight at this church parking lot. As much as everybody didn't want to, just like naturally their minds were going that they think this was a connection with Leslie Mahaffey and police really didn't want to go there and I think we've all noticed a lot in these cases where they don't specifically want to go to like there's a serial killer and this is a connection um, mostly because they don't want the community to go in like an uproar if it's not needed and so that definitely happened in this case but the media fed into that for sure. So on the morning of April 30th, there's a man who was driving to work early in the morning, it was around like 6 a.m. And he arrives in like Burlington and he spots this, I think it was like this like abandoned conveyor of sorts, but he was going to use some of like the scrap metal and sell it off. So he pulls over to go and check it out. And when he gets up closer, he sees like a body in fetal position. So he runs back into his truck and then he goes and he drives for help. And when police arrive, everybody's first thoughts are it's probably Kristen because she, again, is the only girl that has been reported missing recently, but her description doesn't match. Kristen had like long brown hair and the person that they found had like really 
short choppy like cropped hair and then they noticed that the tip of her little finger is missing and that was used as like an identifying description from her family so before like dna even comes back they're like okay well something happened to like alter her description but this is Kristen. investigators said that it appeared she had been dead for only about like 12 to 24 hours which means that she would have been kept alive for 13 days and just a reference of how much she was adored there was 4,000 people who attended her funeral. I read that the church crammed about like 2,800 and then the remaining individuals were just all outside waiting. So after Kristen was found, they had a profiler weigh in on the case to see if there, you know, if anybody thought that there was like a connection that the media was thinking was between Leslie and Kristen. And we all know, like I really am intrigued by profilers. So this profiler said that they believed there was two assailants. They thought they lived this rich fantasy life um, and that one was dominant and the true predator and he would have abduction and like assault fantasies. This person would have no guilt or remorse for the family or the victims. This person was also impulsive and unpredictable, especially when they were under stress. And he would harbor a deep hatred for women, including his mother. The profiler said that the accomplice was most likely a follower and probably didn't come up with these plans, but went along with them willingly. The two of them would have a close bond. And if they weren't related, they were two people who spent like every day together. And he threw out there that the accomplice might be scared to come forward, but pleaded with them on the show to like do so and call for help. And this was like a little bit of a tactic to almost give this assailant like an excuse to call and be like, okay, like they've already given me a way out. And they didn't necessarily believe that this person was like completely unwilling. So over 44,000 tips were called in after this special aired. There were loads of people who were calling, they were implicating like ex-spouses, neighbors, like their dog walkers. There were even, I think 10 people who called in and were like, I'm the one who did it, which is always so messed up to me. Like that's not unusual. There's so many people who false confess and I just, I don't, I don't get it. One of the calls that came through was for someone who didn't have a tip, but they were wondering if the police were looking into a possible connection between Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French's murder and the Scarborough rape. And it wasn't something that the police were looking into because the MO didn't seem to fit. Also, the attacks were different and nothing had really transpired anymore in Scarborough. A little background on the Scarborough rapist. So the Scarborough rapist came to light on May 4th, 1987, when a young girl was walking home from the bus stop and she was just like steps from her house and all of a sudden she was grabbed from behind and she was dragged in between like her house and the neighbor's house and she was assaulted. She said initially she was just like frozen with fear and then instantly she like snapped out of it and she was able to scream and her dad luckily heard her so he comes running to help her and it scares off this individual but unfortunately neither of them got a look at who it was. And then only 10 days after that, another woman is attacked, almost following like the exact same blueprint. Like she gets off of the bus, she's just about to arrive to her house. Again, she's grabbed from behind and she's attacked. Her attack though, it seemed to be even more aggressive than the last. So people were under the impression that whoever this was, was just like harboring and releasing even more rage. In this situation, police did feel like the two were connected. They weren't like, okay, this is not like a serial or anything they were taking it really seriously like as far as this being a predator who was actively seeking women when they interviewed both girls their statements were almost identical like this guy made them repeat almost word for word the same thing basically being like yeah like you're the man and like fluffing up his ego just barf break but with them being on the lookout and being really hyper aware of what's going on, things settle down. And then a few months after, a 15 year old is walking home again from the bus stop. She's just about to arrive at home. She's 
taken from behind and she's attacked again between her house and the neighbor's house and this goes on for over an hour this time. These attacks keep happening and like police suspected, each one was getting more brutal than the last. There was a woman who was tied to the fence with a belt another one was attacked with a knife. After that, one woman suffered a broken collarbone and arm, so it was just getting just horrific. Again, they weren't getting a clear look at this guy, but they were mentioning that he would always rummage through their stuff and take almost like a souvenir of sorts, whether it be like a library card or their ID or a credit card or something. He always went through their belongings and took something with him. Something that is so frustrating in this, and it's like, why do people people like this get breaks sometimes is that they were able to collect DNA from the victims but the Scarborough rapist was a non-secretor. I didn't know what this means but what it means was that they're not able to identify the blood type of the individual based on the swabs that they collect and according to the book that I read only 20% of the population is non-secretor. So of course this guy was one of them. And because of this, the attacks continue for a couple more years and another five women are attacked. And then finally in 1990, a woman was able to get a pretty clear look at her attacker. She said they appear to be a male between 18 and 22 years old. This guy was around six feet and like not like muscular like bodybuilder, but like muscular in shape. She said he had baby blue eyes and tanned skin and he had like flippy hair, almost like a surfer California vibe. So the tips roll out like crazy after this and they collect uh, over 1600 samples of DNA to match against the sample that they have, but nobody's a match. As this composite sketch is like making its way around media, Paul Bernardo's friends look at it and they're like, this is actually eerie how similar this sketch looks to Paul. So one of his friend's girlfriends actually calls the police and she tips them off and says, listen, like I know a guy who looks exactly like this. His name is Paul Bernardo. You have to go and check him out. So he submits his DNA and does an interview with them and he doesn't hear back. So when his friends were asking him about it, he told them like, yeah, I went and I submitted my DNA and I'm cleared. Like they didn't find anything. And he's really pissed off that anybody would even insinuate or ask him. He's like, I don't need this shit. Like, this could completely mess up my entire life. Why are you even asking? Basically trying to gaslight them to make them feel that this composite sketch does not look exactly like him. Come on, Paul. So after that, one of his best friends approaches another friend and he's like, listen, do you think there's a possibility that Paul is in any way connected to these missing girls? For some reason, he just couldn't shake the conversations that he used to have with Paul where he specifically would mention this like virgin farm and like being attracted to younger women, girls. And then not only that, he's like, and then we've got this, you know, photo sketch of the Scarborough rapist and it looks identical to him. And what a coincidence that as soon as Paul moves from Scarborough to St. Catharines to live with Carla, they stop. So one of his friends decides to contact a connection that he had at the police department instead of going to put like in a formal tip. And so the police from there decide to just pay like a random visit to Paul at his house. So on May 12th, 1992, they get to his house. They ask him what he was doing on the day that Kristen French disappeared. And he tells them he was probably at the recording studio uh, working on his newest album because he was working on becoming uh, the next white rapper yeah he thought he was better than vanilla ice he did admit to them that he had already submitted a sample of dna and didn't hear back and was cleared so they seem satisfied with it and they leave several months later though like after that things start imploding around paul bernardo one day carla shows up to work and she's got like severe black eyes. I'm talking like, it doesn't even look real, it looks painted black eyes. And she tells her coworkers that she had gotten into a car accident with her friend, which none of them buy. So they tip off her mom and make like a private phone call. And they say, you know, like it's not our place, but I think you should make an unexpected visit to go and check on Carla. She does not look well. And we're not like buying the story that she's giving us. 
So her mom comes by and she gives her the same story that she's been in a car accident and her mom keeps pressing. She's like, no, this is this is not from a car accident. There is something going on. You need to tell me the truth. So Carla finally confesses that Paul had attacked her with a flashlight. So her family pretty much has to kidnap her to get her out of the house and they take her to the hospital. She ends up spending three days in the hospital and at the time she's interviewed by police, but she doesn't want to press charges. She doesn't want Paul to get in any trouble, uh, but her family doesn't want her to go back as much as she wants to. So they almost like put her in hiding at her aunt and uncle's house. Back at her and Paul's home, I guess he's a mess that she's left. He has friends coming in and out to try to console him. They don't know if he's gonna make it. Boo and who? His friends are like, hey, well, you know, what happened? We saw her, she looks in really bad shape. And Paul says, oh, she, she fell off a ladder. And they're like, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Like we've seen your guys' entire relationship. Like Carla can't even go to the bathroom without you being present. Like she's constantly glued to you. You guys are always together. She would never leave the house and leave you if she just like fell off of a ladder. So Paul admits that he had hit her with a flashlight, but he quickly follows up like to make himself like look better. He's like, well, you know, like she's not so innocent either. He says, you know, Tammy's death was no accident and Carla was involved and I have video evidence to prove it. Naturally, they try to get him to elaborate, but he just ends the conversation from there and changes the subject. So on February 9th, 1993, police arranged to interview Carla after this attack. She reluctantly agrees to do it just under the conditions that her aunt and uncle are allowed to be present. And the police said that she was very standoffish. She would only give very short one answered answers, did not want to be involved whatsoever or like implicate Paul in, in anything. And they weren't specifically talking about her attack. They were asking like questions about their personal life and like Paul's, you know, preferences, if he had like any weird like kinks and fantasies. And she's like, huh but doesn't want to elaborate any further. So she's like, no, like nothing, nothing that I know of, nothing out of the ordinary. And when they leave, her aunt's like, okay, what is going on that had nothing to do with what happened to you? And Carla just like up and says, you know, the Scarborough fist. And she's like, yeah. And she's like, that's Paul. Then her aunt asks her, has he killed anyone? And Carla just shakes her head yes. And she says, was he responsible for those two girls' murders? meaning Leslie and Kristen, and Carla just says yes. As her aunt is processing this, she also drops a bomb on her and says that she's also involved and that she's on videotape with the girls, with Paul, so she's equally as guilty as Paul is. She said with Leslie, she was standing outside of her house, locked out, and Paul was stalking the area and they kind of like ran into each other and he didn't know what to say to her. And he was like, oh, I'm just uh, trying to break into your neighbor's house here. And she was like, okay, cool, neat. Goes and sits down on the step, has a conversation with Paul and she asks him if he's got a cigarette. And so he sees an opportunity here and he just goes with it, he says, yeah, he has one in the car. So she agrees to go to the car with him to have a cigarette, but just under the condition that she will leave like the passenger door open. And so when they get to the car, Paul pulls out a knife, closes the door, and he takes Leslie back to his house. When he got home, Carla said he woke her up and told her that he like found a girl for them. Again, I'm not gonna get into graphic description of what happened, but there is video evidence of both Paul and Carla involved with Leslie. Carla said that she begged to go home so she could see her little brother again. She promised that she wasn't gonna tell anybody what they looked like. Carla said when they were done, Paul gave her a sleeping pill and when she was asleep, he strangled her with an electrical cord. I guess she actually woke up gasping for air several minutes later and so he went back and just like repeated the process again. Carla said they brought Leslie down to their basement and the next day it was Father's Day and she was having her dad over for dinner. And while her parents were there having Father's Day dinner, 
Leslie was downstairs and they actually almost got caught because her mom was making her way to the basement to go get I think potatoes and Carla like quickly runs to like close the door and she's like I'll get the potatoes like you don't need to go down there and do it yourself and yet like the whole time Leslie was down there so when Carla went to work the next day she said that Paul had just Leslie and put her in the concrete slabs and then called her to say that it was done and all they needed to do was go and dispose of her together. Carla said Kristen was much more defiant. She flat out said that like she would rather die than do some of the things that Paul wanted her to. With Kristen, they kept her alive for quite a while. Carla even said that she would have conversations with her when Paul had left a couple times and Kristen said to her, you know, like you don't need to stay here in this relationship with him like he treats you like shit, as almost like she's like talking to a friend she's like you know like let me go you can go we'll grab your dog like you can we can get out of this together and Carla told her aunt she was too scared and didn't help her so her aunt tells her clearly you need a lawyer immediately so she meets with a lawyer the next day and he says okay like you can't communicate with anybody anymore not your aunt not your uncle police nobody and let me deal with this. So on February 17th, 1993, police arrest Paul for the Scarborough rapist attacks. It turns out he was never actually ruled out at all. What happened was they had over like a thousand samples to go through and the budget that they had to go through them had completely run out. So they ran out of all of their money and they financially couldn't fund piecing through the samples. So when they finally were able to and they got Paul's DNA, they ran it against the Scarborough race and it turns out it was a match. So when they get him to the interrogation room, they go right for it. They're like, hey, like we, we're we not even gonna play games with like the Scarborough thing. We already know you did that, but we also know that you were involved in Kristen and Leslie's murders. And they insinuate that Carla had spoken to them and that she, it was now gonna be a game of who was gonna throw the other under the bus first. But Paul didn't bite, he just, completely denied like having any knowledge of the two and so he was just put in jail that day. Carla finds out about his arrest actually on the radio after her and her aunt had gone shopping and random fact the apple didn't fall far from like the Bernardo tree even though Paul and Ken Bernardo were not like blood related they had a lot of similarities because Paul's court appearance was also scheduled on the same day as his dad's court appearance who was being charged with a second assault in the 60s not Paul Bernardo hasn't said anything but it really makes you wonder like if he knew like anything about his dad or like if he like followed along with his dad or was like a, a sidekick when he was younger or something I don't know it's just it's weird so on May 18th 1993 Carla's lawyers propose a plea bargain Carla would be charged with manslaughter in both Leslie and Kristen's death and they also requested that she be permitted to have bail until her trial. The judge agrees and on July 6, 1993, Carla pleads guilty to manslaughter and she is sentenced to 12 years in prison. 12 years. Paul's trial isn't until September 1994, which is the following year. And before he goes to trial, he leads his lawyers like on this like treasure map of his house and they discover a bunch of videotape footage that he had like hidden in like the pot light of his ceiling and these were a huge part of the trial it essentially was like the entire trial it wasn't until may 18th 1995 that his trial actually starts i think i just said like september 94 is when it starts that's when they found the videotape sorry guys so at his trial carla is the star witness Part of her deal was to confess her version of events to implicate Paul. And her version of what happened was basically that she was a battered wife. She was under the control of Paul and everything that she did was his idea and that she was threatened and abused to go along with what he wanted her to. She admitted that she even went along with dressing in her sister Tammy's clothes prior to Tammy's death and would like pretend to be her while they were, you know, together. She said when this wasn't enough for him anymore, she agreed to 
present her sister almost like a gift to her husband and allow him to sleep with her to take her virginity. They decided that the best way to do this was going to be to drop her. So Carla stole some medication from the veterinarian clinic that she worked at, including a bottle of halothane, which was used as like an anesthetic for the animals. She said that Paul had crushed up sleeping pills and was putting those in the drinks that he was serving Tammy on the night of her death. And when she was unconscious, that's when the attack took place. This attack is part of some of the video footage that was recovered and both Carla and Paul are present. Carla said that they felt like she was waking up a little bit so that's when she covered a cloth in the halothane and she put it on her sister's face and then that's when she went like fully unconscious. After she brought that up, experts were like, okay, that now makes sense as to what that mark on her face was because it was actually a chemical burn. On the tape, Carla says she's doing what she was instructed prior by Paul, um, but on it you can hear that she's got like a little bit of hesitation um, towards him asking her to do certain acts, and this is disputed by both sides. Paul says the reason why Carla didn't want to participate in a certain act and says no on the tape was because she realizes that Tammy is menstruating. Carla's version is that she said, no, I don't wanna participate in this at all. Carla's version doesn't really make sense though because she was participating throughout. Like the most disgusting, sick people you could ever think of in the entire world is an understatement with these two, you guys. Carla says after this first tape was made with her sister, she knew what her role was for future footage, meaning Leslie and Kristen, and that she was expected to put a smile on and pretend that she was enjoying it, but really she wasn't. Again, this is disputed though, because there is footage of her and Paul, like when they're just together, where she is pretty much reminiscing about Tammy and telling him how proud she was of him to be able to, you know, live out that fantasy and that if she was able to get, you know, 50 more girls for him, then she would. Carla talks about Leslie's 24 hour attack. What's so sickening is she was led to believe the whole entire time that she was gonna get let go. During her testimony, she would admit that she would go along with Paul and go on car rides to stalk young girls together. She said many times they would like follow them to their house and then he would get out of the car and stand outside their window and like pleasure himself while she like watched in the car. She also admitted to luring other victims at Paul's request always is what she said. Carla said she reached out to a 16 year old who actually used to work with her at the veterinarian clinic and she looked up to Carla like a big sister so she was really excited to hang out with her. And Carla said she like brought her home and presented her as like a gift to Paul. So they drugged her drinks and she says all she can remember is that she had two drinks and then woke up like not with no recollection of what happened. While she was unconscious though, Paul assaulted her. This was on video as well, which is so horrendous because she has absolutely no idea and she actually continues to hang out with them. She just thought that she had like drank too much and didn't really remember what happened and passed out. She said like Carla would call her to hang out and she would almost push her to like be in a relationship with Paul. She said to her that Paul and her weren't really together. They were like married, but like Paul was allowed to date other women. And she says like, I'm not even really comfortable with that because I'm not into him. Like I'm, I wanna be your friend. I look up to you and you're who I wanna hang out with. She said she did end up like hooking up with him a few times, but mainly to like please Carla because it seemed like it was something she was pushing for her to do. And then one day she just had enough and she went to Paul and she was like, like I'm not interested in you at all. So Paul kicks her out of the house and as she's leaving, Carla's like, I'm really disappointed in you. Carla talked about coming home from work around 2.30 on the day of Kristen's disappearance. And she said they planned it around then so that they could go and like stalk the area for girls who were walking home from school. Carla says they noticed Kristen and he circles around to kind of like beat her because it looks like she's going to be walking on a certain path like in front of the church. So they prepare themselves
themselves and they go to the church parking lot and it's Carla who calls for Kristen to come over and she tells her that she's lost and she's wondering if she can help her give directions. So Kristen's like, yeah, for sure. And she goes over willingly and Carla pulls out this map. And as she's looking down, Paul comes from behind and he shoves her into the car and Carla gets behind her and she's holding her hair so that she doesn't move. Carla says though that Kristen was just like, almost like you fuckers. She didn't fight. She wasn't aggressive. She just sat in the car obedient. Carla says with Kristen, they learned a little bit more about her. They sat down and had drinks with her and gave her the impression that, you know, if she cooperated with everything they wanted her to do, she was going to be allowed to go home. She says that she has quite a few siblings that she's close with. She used to be a rower, but she had a back injury, so she wasn't able to do that anymore. She talks about her boyfriend that she loves very much and also about the fact that she's going to be in a wedding in the summer as a bridesmaid and she's really excited about it. And she shares with them that in the future she wants to be a lawyer and a vet. And for me, like when I read that, I thought like, I wonder how Carla felt about that because those were her dreams at that age. And it just didn't seem to affect her in any way whatsoever. So throughout the several days that she's with Paul and Carla, she does everything she's told because she's led under the impression that she's going to be let go. And no matter how horrific or humiliating it is, she just wants to get back to her family. One night, Kristen asked if Paul would go and get her a McDonald's pizza because she hadn't tried it yet. I totally forgot that McDonald's tried to do pizza. So he goes and he gets her one and at this point her and Carla are by themselves and that's when she's trying to you know bond with Carla and tell her you know why why do you stay we should just go and it wasn't even like she was trying to be like you know like let me go she seemed like genuinely interested in also helping like Carla get out of the situation and Carla said that again she couldn't do it because she was scared. Carla said on the last morning that Kristen was alive she was just like over it she wasn't like obedient she basically said like there were certain things that just were worth dying over carla said she knew that that was going to be the day that Kristen was going to die not only just because of the way like she was defying them but because it was easter weekend and they had to go to carla's parents house to have easter dinner like that nonchalant. Paul ends Kristen's life the same way he ended Leslie's. And then after that, they just like showered up and got ready to go to her parents' house. When they got back, Carla said she cut Kristen's hair to make sure that she got rid of any like DNA or like fibers from their carpet in it. So when the police found her and she had short hair, that was why. They decided to drive to Burlington to leave Kristen because that's where around the area where Leslie was found. So they were hoping to like throw off investigators thinking like someone from that area was responsible. And Carla says shortly after this, there was also another girl who no one knew about. She was another victim that survived and it was actually Tammy's best friend. And Paul had happened to see her walking by. And so he told Carla, you know, oh, you should call her. I want her to come over. Her friend seemed so happy to hear from Carla because it was almost like, you know, hanging out with Tammy's older sister again and just like have that bond. So they hung out for a little bit and she said that Paul would hit on her and it made her uncomfortable because can you? I guess he like laid off a little bit and then tried the whole like courting route. He would take her out for dinner, buy her nice things, give her like presents and stuff like that. And then same thing like they did with Carla's coworker. She would kind of like coax her into like being interested in Paul saying that like she was okay with it and like almost like a girlfriend trying to set somebody up with their husband. And I can't imagine being in that situation and just having like that like battle go through you where you've got this like bond with somebody who you look up to and you are feeling uncomfortable but you also don't want to let them down. So she ends up like doing what she thinks is going to make them happy and then finds out that Paul tells her that like Tammy used to do it too which I don't believe. I think it was just like sick predatory tactics. Tactics. Paul and Carla actually divorced a year before the trial starts and I guess like uh, Carla started taking like a sociology class for like two years prior to this trial which I felt was like very interesting because it's like she's taking this class knowing that she's got to like do this testimony and she can almost kind of like 
study to give, I don't know, I guess a version of events that made her like look better. Kind of like gives her time to know like what people are gonna look for to like gain sympathy, if that makes sense. And she did definitely portray herself as a victim, but when the defense had time to like cross-examine her, they had tons of like love letters. She used to leave a love note like on a post-it every single night of their relationship on Paul's pillow. And lots of these letters showed that she was on board with Paul's interests and fantasies. One said, roses are red, violets are blue. Nothing more fun than a pervert like you. Good one, Carla. Another one was a card that said, you're a disgusting, vulgar sex maniac. I like that in a man. After Tammy dies, you know, she says she's so devastated by it and so shocked and ashamed, yet she moves in with Paul. And she's writing to her friends about how excited she is to still, you know, carry through and plan this wedding with him. It's gonna be, you know, like a good distraction, finally something to look forward to after Tammy's death, the death she's responsible for. And even though Carla's parents are clearly reeling from the death of their youngest daughter and have to pay unexpected funeral expenses, Paul and Carla expected them to hold up their end of the bargain that they had when they first got engaged when Tammy was alive and they agreed to help pay for the wedding. And then now they're like, you know, like, we'll go into debt if we give you this money, we can't do it. And Carla throws a tantrum, like a straight up fit, like a diva and suggests to them that if they can't afford it, then maybe they should remortgage their house so that they could still get married. And she even writes to her friends about how like selfish her parents are and how much she hates them. Paul ends up taking the stand in his own trial and he denies being responsible for killing the girls. He says in both instances he had left and when he came back, Carlo was with them and said like something had happened and that they died. With Leslie, he said that they had given her sleeping pills and the intention was to make her fall asleep so that they could load her in the car and she wouldn't notice the neighborhood or like his car and license plate. And he said he had to go and get gas in the car and when he came back from getting gas, she was dead and Carla said she thinks maybe she had had too many sleeping pills. So he said they were both like devastated by it because they never wanted to kill anybody. That was never the intention. It was just about like this fantasy and they didn't know how to you know, kind of explain how this girl had arrived at their house. So the only thing that they could do was dispose of her body. With Kristen, Paul said it was Carla who initially spotted her and that he was not interested in like that appearance. It was Carla who was attracted to like pretty brunettes, not him. His version of events as far as like the abuse that she had to endure for those days matched Carla's except for the moment she died. He says he did go out to go and get food for them and that when he came back, Carla was crying and she told him that she had tried to escape and that she had to stop her. And when he went upstairs, she was unresponsive. While he's testifying, he also admits that with Tammy, the night she died was actually not the first time that they had ever drugged her. He said that prior to that night, Carla had ground up Valium and put it in spaghetti sauce and had her eat it. And then when she passed out, they both assaulted her. He admitted that they also tried to do it on numerous occasions, but it didn't work. He also says that he would often spy on her with Carla's help. Carla would position her blinds so that Paul could like creep in and watch Tammy. He also said that there were times where when Tammy was asleep, he would like stand in her room and Carla would watch and he would touch himself. It's, it's physically hard to like form words and not throw up. He does admit that throughout the relationship, there were times that he did hit Carla. And as he's talking to the jury, like reading it was just, it was so messed up because he's so nonchalant. It's like he's explaining what he had for dinner. He's like describing like the most messed up fantasies that he has as if it's normal like everybody has them so at one point after he's done like describing like how freaking messed up he is he looks at the jury and he's like i think down the road i'm probably going to have to seek professional help people literally started laughing in the courtroom because they were like do you fucking think so bro you probably should down the road you needed professional help out of the womb you needed professional help when you were still a tadpole 
Ugh. Ultimately, he was found guilty without the possibility of parole for 25 years, which uh, we've already talked about in Canada is a life sentence. I don't ever think he would get in front of a parole board and get out though, so I'm sure he's going to be there for life. In July 2005, Carla was released after serving her sentence, and I just learned that apparently she was supposed to be released in Alberta, which is where I live, but our province kicked up like such a stink that um, she wasn't allowed to come here. They decided that they would relocate her to Quebec and they thought that maybe because of Quebec being like primarily French speaking, they wouldn't have had the same access to what the rest of Canada did for the trial, like makes no sense anyways. So she did end up moving to Quebec and I just learned today after talking to my cousin that she actually lived three blocks away from where he lives or lived, she's moved now, but nobody knew. They had no idea in the neighborhood. And I did know that Carla was found like a couple times by people. She keeps trying to change her name and stuff. But one of the times they found out that she was actually volunteering, and hanging out with children, going in the classroom, going on field trips, doing things with them. And nobody knew who the heck she was. Like, how does that happen? Especially around children. I can understand if you like, no one knew that you were the door greeter at Walmart or something like that, but you are volunteering at your children's school. And I feel so bad for them. Like that is, it is in no way their fault at all. I actually read as of January, 2020, she was no longer living with her husband or her kids. I don't know specifically what that means, but she's not far from where she was living that was like close to my family's house. So she's still in Quebec from what I know. And when it comes to her, there's so much controversy. There have been experts who didn't actually treat Carla, who have like weighed in on the situation that say that she does show characteristics of being somebody who had battered wife syndrome. They think that she was vulnerable to him basically because of how infatuated she was with him. One of the professionals that I read about in the book said that she was a diagnostic mystery pretty much because she would show certain characteristics that would say, okay, like, yeah, she fits this, she fits this like textbook point, 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 but then she would like completely do a 180 and then show signs of being like somebody who was willingly a participant and also shared some of these like fantasies. Plus there were a lot of people who testified that she was a very opinionated girl. And although Paul was the one in control of the relationship, that's like what she was looking for in a relationship. She wanted to be a submissive. She wanted somebody to take care of her. And she really like admired having this like guy who was in control to like tell her what to do. Some experts think that Paul is a sexual sadist and I mean, I would probably really agree with that. He definitely matches the same patterns to like control their victims, but he's never been diagnosed as one. And when I read like certain characteristics, again, it was like very similar to Carla. It was like that they like fit a lot of them and then there were some that just absolutely didn't make sense. Like a lot of times they will isolate their victims from like friends and family where they were like complete opposite. And it was like very, you know, in the open, hanging out with everybody and like nobody knew what was going on behind closed doors. And he never like took Carla away from anybody. He enjoyed being like the house that like hosted people. He enjoyed like having their friends over and he wasn't even close with his own family, but he was very close with the Homokas and was okay with like Carla being close to her family too. He also didn't like control other aspects of her life like finances. Oftentimes you would see that where it's like somebody feels very trapped because they have nothing. Carla had a job. She was actually the one who had like an actual legit steady job all of the time, made her own money. And he was the one who was like, kind of just like bouncing from scam to scam. So I definitely see like the arguments on both sides. But for me, like when it comes to her, I just like, there's just not enough to completely excuse like what she did as being like, oh yeah, Paul controlled everything and she was scared. Although I will say that I truly don't believe that if she had been in a really healthy relationship with somebody who she looked at as like infatuated as she was with Paul and they weren't a psycho, I don't think that she would have done these things like on her own. This was obviously Paul's world, his fantasy was something that he talked about with his friends at a very young age. So I think that like just the obsession that she had with him led her to like 
kind of adapt and just take on those obsessions and like fantasies herself. That being said though, I, I don't think that excuses the fact that like she still did carry on what she did. So like, yeah, she could have been in a healthy relationship where she wouldn't have done those things, but she wasn't and then she did do those things. So it's not surprising that like a lot of people do not agree with her being let out, especially after 12 years. I wanna know what you guys think about it. Where do you guys fall in it? I'm really curious actually to see if there's like a divide or if it's clear cut she should still be in jail. I think one thing that's also devastating in these situations is that there's still like victims' families who are living their life and trying to get over what happened. And this is constantly something that's going to, you know, carry on for the rest of their lives. And with Carla Homoka, she's always trying to fight for certain rights. Like she wants to be able to change her name and nobody knows. She wants to be able to move away and not have to like answer to police or anything like that because she fears that like her location is going to be leaked and it's like every time something like this comes up you still have these victims families who are hearing about it involved in the case knowing about it and it's like their children are gone and you care about your privacy that's what frustrates me in these situations is sometimes it becomes so much more about the people who harmed a victim took somebody's life and then they try to spin it as like their now the victim I feel like you should be like you know like if you felt remorse and you really feel bad for what you did you're just like yep this is I put myself in the situation I made my bet I gotta lay in it it is what it is okay that's it for me today you guys thank you so much for watching if you haven't already please don't forget to like and subscribe it means the world to me you know I love and I appreciate you so so much I will see you next Wednesday for our next wine Wednesday I'll miss you terribly until then make sure to love each other love yourself and I will see you soon